So I thought we did have students this Wednesday, so it shows what I know, but we'll see. Um, this morning we do come to the last message in our Christ and Culture series where we're taking a look at issues that uh, have been central to the cultural discussion, to the news, um, to informed homes and individuals uh, for the last number of months, some of them a few years, but which are being highlighted significantly in an election season. Uh, this morning we come to one that I've never preached on, uh, so it's been interesting to prepare for, but I uh, was looking at six different reputable sources that were outlining the major issues involved in the political campaigns, uh, at least, of the Democratic and Republican uh, nominees for president, and five of the six had crime among the top six there, uh, so it was hard to not dive in. So uh, this morning, I'm going to say some things that are not usually said. I know that will not stun you if you're here very often. Um, I will probably slightly offend you all at some point. Uh, I pray that that is uh, the Scripture and not me, but it could be either. Um, but my intent is that it's the Scripture. So we're going to uh, jump in here and take a look at the the concept of crime and of of punishment within a legal system in a society through a biblical lens, seeking to be faithful to Scripture and sound theologically as we draw uh, biblical principles for this topic uh, that we believe are universal. Let me pray for us, and I'll give you time to find First uh, Peter, the book of First Peter, toward the back of the Bible uh, while I'm praying. But let's let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do know, in light of many stories just from this last week, what a significant topic this is. God, we confess that we are a violent nation. God, we are a nation that seems to be spiraling toward personal acts of evil and violence. Often, Lord, for no particular reason and with no particular victim in mind, just anyone that can be found in the moment. So God, we ask for your mercy to be on us. God, we ask that justice in all facets would prevail in our nation. Guide us this morning, God, as we come together under your word. Father, I pray for those who are in this room or listening online or joining us online live right now who may be particularly impacted by this message due to their own experience. And I pray that you would draw near to them, speak to them, give them comfort and peace. God, speak truth to us all, and I pray uh, that every word that's said would come from you, Father. And if anything's said from this pulpit that is not from you, God, I pray in your great love and power, that you would strike it from the memory and the mind of those hearing. Guide us with your spirit. Father, form us more into the people that you call us to be. I pray all of this in Jesus' faithful, powerful, and victorious name. Amen. All right, I have probably always had a, a somewhat heightened interest, I guess, in the legal system, in law enforcement, in justice uh, from the time that I was little bitty. I've shared with you guys that back when church could be fun and you could bring things, my little brother would often carry a halter to church on Sunday mornings. Uh, just We came from a ranching family and that was just his thing and I would almost always carry a pistol. A fake one, of course. We weren't that Texan, but I'd have it in a holster, you know, and that wasn't weird then. So, yeah, that's just always been, I think, in my DNA. And, and then uh, sitting in a dentist's office thinking about what I was going to do with my life or what I thought I would be doing with my life following graduation from high school. I was a junior 
um, at the time and waiting to have my teeth cleaned. And I look down at the little table beside me in the waiting room. There's always a stack of magazines. Most of them are insignificant and trivial. I looked and I, I found one that was a People magazine and the cover caught me um, almost instantly. It was a, a picture of Polly Class and she was featured in that article. I sat there and read the entire article before I went back to see the dentist and it solidified something in me, a desire in me uh, to give my life in some service to law enforcement and or our legal system by way of being a federal prosecutor or in federal law enforcement. Go ahead and put that up and leave it up for a few minutes. Um, Polly Class was a 12-year-old girl having a slumber party in her own home when she was abducted on October 1st, 1993 in Petaluma, California. Richard Allen Davis climbed through the window of her bedroom after having watched her at a park close to her home and seeing where she lived. He climbed in, scared the other girls there into being quiet while he abducted Polly out the window with her mother and older sister in the home in another room. Didn't hear anything until the girls came running out after it was done. Her body was discovered two months later on December 4th of 1993. And her kidnapping, assault, and murder by uh, Richard Allen Davis, who was an ex-con with a history of alcohol and drug abuse, he was in and out of jail and prison, and was out on parole at this time following a previous kidnapping conviction. It prompted outrage across California and across the United States. It was one of the first really visible nationally televised um, cases like this in our nation's history, and demands for harsher sentencing laws. Um, Davis had an arrest record that stretched back more than two decades. Arrested multiple times. He'd been convicted in 1976 for kidnapping and assault of a woman and served five years before he was released that time. Uh, in 1984, he was convicted again for kidnapping and other charges and given a 16-year sentence, of which he served eight years and was out on parole when he kidnapped and murdered Polly Class. After her murder, California voters demanded action, and the California legislature adopted the three strikes you're out law as a result of Polly's death, which called for, which called for increased sentencing for repeat offenders like Davis. He was convicted of killing her in 1996 and sent to San Quentin's death row, where he currently remains, as the state of California has overturned the death penalty, at least for now. You can put that down now. Polly's story grabbed me. It created a fire in me. Clearly, since I'm up here right now, God chose to, sue, uh, to do different things with my life. But I entered college as a criminal justice major with a double minor in political science and pre-law. And that is the direction I thought my life would take, minus uh, some time for military service. So this has always been something that has been of interest to me. Um, I was fascinated with it enough that maybe for Christmas, I don't remember, for something my senior year, my parents bought me, back then you could buy these cassette tape um, like packs, and they bought me this pack of all the Supreme Court cases that had been decided, uh, like being read the transcripts of the discourse of the decisions, and I actually listened to all of those uh, on cassette tape. Some were super boring, but I did it just to be a winner. Some of them were, some of them were really interesting. Um, we have a massive issue with crime in our country. We are, it, it got so numerous as I did research for this, I don't even have to cite it, but um, we are by far uh, the most violent developed nation in the world, by far, per capita. So we can't just go, well, we've got more crime because we've got more people. Per capita, we are 
by an unimaginable degree the most violent developed nation and western nation in the world with more gun crime more violent crimes of all types this week as those of you who were in our biblical interpretation class on wednesday heard me say the the violent acts of this young man shows the evil that that dwells in the hearts of so many and seems to go unchecked in our nation it's funny if you're my kid's age or or one of the 20 somethings in here school shootings are normal for them uh, i don't ever remember one before columbine i was a senior in college when Columbine happened, uh, we've had far um, more unfathomable ones since then. We've got a real problem, a problem with the soul of our nation. We can say that a perpetrator uses a gun or an knife or something else to commit a crime, but the degree at which that's happening tells us that there's something wrong in the heart of our nation. We know there's something wrong in the hearts of human beings, but there's something wrong in the heart of our nation, of a nation that is the most blessed, I guess, materially, of any nation in human history. And so with that a little bit, obviously it's been uh, in the news, uh, crime has been in the news uh, so much over the last few years because of the so-called attempts to um, reform the bail system, which has allowed uh, even violent criminals to be out within hours. Uh, the police are doing their job to the best uh, of their abilities, and the courts are releasing, judges are releasing, um, prosecutors are deciding not to prosecute. There seems at times to be no rhyme or rhythm. Uh, Christy Dasher could steal some of my shoes from my office up here and get a harsher prison sentence than someone who commits murder. There seems to be no, um, no compass for what's happening. We know we've addressed migrant crime. It's not so much that it's uh, high, it's not, it's extremely low, but it is especially insidious and heinous when committed by illegal immigrants who should not be here in the first place. That's what makes those violent crimes so significant and so rightfully morally outrageous i want to remind you as we read first uh, a couple of verses in first peter chapter 2 of the beginning of legal enforcement of statutes and laws that we talked about a few weeks ago that we actually find in genesis 3 but before we go there let's read first peter chapter 2 verses 12 through 14 in verse 12, Peter writes and says, Live such good lives among the pagans, among non-believers, among the unchurched, that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. I wanted to, to read this verse to give some contextual light on what we're about to read, that the way you and I live and what we are called to do is to have the ultimate end of the glory of God. That even pagans would look at our lives. They'll accuse us and then they'll set their accusations alongside the light of our lives and in ways that we don't understand and Peter doesn't flesh out, glorify God on the day he visits us. So Peter goes on in verse 13 and says, Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority. That's the dog catcher, the librarian, the house inspector, all the way up to law enforcement officers, judges, national government, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Submit yourselves to the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor as the supreme authority or to governors who are sent by him 
to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. So here we see again what we saw in Romans 13, and we'll briefly look at again in the um, body of the message this morning, this idea that God has established civil authorities for the order, protection, and justice of human societies. And we as Christians who know God and are privileged to know his word and to understand the ordering of society ought to be the first to submit to governing authorities. They're here for a reason. We have seen over the last four years, three, four years, and going back further than that some, but especially in the last few years, we've seen uh, property crime rise at an, at an all-time high rate without any fear of law enforcement doing anything or the justice system doing anything. All of you over the last few years have seen on the news mobs going into stores, taking whatever they please. Sometimes they're not even in a hurry. And I will just tell you that uh, that idea and that mindset is completely contrary to Scripture, which, which actually acknowledges and it upholds property, private property, public property, the rights of property owners. He uses such strong language from the Lord himself to say, I hate, I hate robbery, I hate theft. So we've seen some of the strangest things. Well, as long as they're not stealing more than $900, it helps the poor. No, it doesn't. It doesn't help develop the character and the human agency that God has given us to allow us to break foundational laws without consequence. Genesis chapter 3, verse 24, which I've referenced before, but I want to remind you, is basically, not to use... uh, a tongue-in-cheek phrase, but the genesis of human government, of law and law enforcement. You'll remember Adam and Eve were banished from the Garden of Eden where the tree of life is. But they're not just banished by God. That banishment is enforced. So verse 23 of Genesis 3 says, The Lord banished him from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. After he drove the man out, he placed on the east side or in front of the Garden of Eden cherubim, angels, and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. You have a legal decree given, legal in the sense that it comes from God, it is a command from God to leave, to exit the place of privilege and place of home that they'd been given by God, and not to return. And then an agent of enforcement of that decree or that law is placed there with a sword, which has uh, historically been a universal emblem of punishment and particularly of execution at the hands of the state. So we, we see the genesis of this idea of crime and punishment of laws and law enforcement in Genesis 3. Now, before we jump uh, into uh, some, some principles that we can take away. I want to just talk to you some about crime and punishment in the Bible and give you some classifications of crimes. Most of this you will find in Exodus and Leviticus. Some you'll find in Numbers. Some you'll find in Deuteronomy. But I don't want you out of hand to dismiss that and go, oh, Old Testament, early Pentateuch stuff. Because it's not religious ceremony we're talking about. We're talking about laws. We're talking about God teaching his people how to exist as a society in a social structure tied to one another. So don't dismiss it. Uh, Classifications of crimes in the Bible. Basically, you've got crimes against God and crimes against man. And I want you to listen to some of the crimes against God that we find in the early books of the Bible. Idolatry. 
infant sacrifice. Isn't that interesting? God considered the killing of infants in his name or in the names of gods or at all to be a crime against him. Why would it be a crime against God? Because God gave the life. God gave the life. Witchcraft and all the other sort of sorcery weirdness that comes with that. Blasphemy, false prophecy, Sabbath breaking, defying the authority of God's law. So knowing God's law and in a sense proverbially spitting in the face of God's law was considered a crime against God and all of these were punishable by different degrees. Crimes against man included what you would imagine, murder, assault, and mayhem. Mayhem is a lot of what we've seen as the defund the police movement grew in our country. Robbery. And robbery, biblically speaking, involves violence or the threat of violence. That's how it's differentiated from theft in Scripture. And it is. And theft. Sex crimes, which included adultery, fornication, seduction and assault, incest and homosexual acts. Dishonoring your parents, which I am a fan of that law. I think we should bring that one back. Kidnapping, malicious prosecution and perjury. Property damage, oppression of the underprivileged. These are representative lists. There were more, but you see in them a great deal of the foundation of modern Western legal systems, of which ours, no doubt, made tremendous leaps forward, at least constitutionally, if not in the execution of the legal system in the United States. Um, but our Constitution and Bill of Rights are uh, a tremendous leap forward when it comes to human history with regard to justice and law. Punishments in the Bible that are meted out for different crimes. Execution by stoning, sword, or fire. I would have hoped I got to pick if it were handed down to me, but usually you did not get a say. Scourging or flogging. I think that would be a good one to bring back. I think a good public flogging is a great deterrent. Not only to the person receiving it, but to all watching it. Mutilation. Uh, this was done lex talionis. So, depending on specific crimes that were done, done to other individuals that left lasting harm to them, typically judges were handing down sentences where the same mutilation was done to the offender. Imprisonment, obviously. Monetary fines and loss of property for restitution. And enslavement. If you couldn't pay fines and you couldn't make restitution, you were often enslaved until you'd made enough money to pay for it or you had worked off your debt, depending the system, place, time, and reason. Not usually more than six years was the term limit. Uh, for this, for Israelites, they would stretch that a little bit for foreigners. Um, but those are just forms. What you're going to find in Scripture when it comes to criminal justice, to crime and to punishment, is principles and not particulars. You have particulars in their early society. But from those particulars and from the teaching of the Old and New Testament, we draw out principles, biblical principles, through which we should, as the people of God, approach this subject of crime and punishment or law and order. So let me draw out some of the principles and let's see where they come from in Scripture. And when you draw out theological or biblical principles, you do so because they come faithfully up from the text, they are faithful to the entirety of the text, and they work and should work universally regardless of time and place, regardless of culture or people. That's what makes them a biblical or theological principle or truth. All right, let's roll through four of these just briefly. The first is this, that followers of Jesus, you and me, 
and us together as a church, followers of Jesus, have a divine mandate to love our enemies. We have a divine mandate to love our enemies. And we have a divine example in Jesus himself of what that love looks like. He loved his enemies even to the point of sacrificing his own life. This is a hard place for us to start, but we have to start here. Because when, when Jesus tells Peter in the garden to put his sword away, what he is doing, in effect, is disarming his followers and disarming the church. And he's not saying that there's not a time to pick up arms, but he's saying the state is the primary bearer of arms. That we are not to go about kingdom work, kingdom life, kingdom enforcement, kingdom character development, redemption, transformation, or anything else through violence. And we know individually this is the case. Let's go back to Matthew chapter 5 and the Sermon on the Mount. As Jesus is speaking about life in the kingdom and the kind of life that is to define and characterize his followers, disciples of Jesus. And I'll just remind us because sometimes I'm astounded. Sometimes I'm astounded at our ability to feel like we're able to come to Jesus on our own terms. Like I come to Jesus and I'll take a little of what he says and I dismiss a little of what he says and I'll make sure I've got enough for heaven but not enough to, to speak to this issue or that issue. Church friends, we, we don't get to come to Jesus that way. We come to him on his terms. He defines what it looks like to follow him. Verse 43 of Matthew chapter 5, Jesus says, You've heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy, which all of us could get down with. I mean, am I right? That sounds good to me. That sounds good. He says, but I tell you, love your enemies. Love your enemies. And pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. Jesus is saying this is a defining characteristic and a defining act. It's not just something that we give consent to or assent to mentally. It is, it is a way in which we behave and we act toward fellow human beings that defines us as children of our Father in heaven, who causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good. And sins reign on the righteous and the unrighteous. And part of what Jesus is saying there is that they will stand as we will stand before their ultimate judge. And until that time, it is not our job as disciples of Jesus individually or in the life of a church to mete out hate on our enemies. This is extremely challenging. We have the benefit now of living in a time where we can, we can readily find examples of deeply gospel-centered men and women of faith, followers of Jesus, who have forgiven in every way faithful to Scripture the murder of their spouse or their child, gone to prison and met with them and talked with them, sought their good, You don't do that in human power, church. You do that through the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit. You do it through the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit. But we're called to this no less. And when you look back at Matthew 25, as Jesus gives another example of what it looks like, of what it looks like to be characterized as his disciples. And he, he gives this specific list four different times. So it seems quite clear that Jesus intends to show us something about that, that list. He's speaking here in terms of the day of judgment. And he says in verse 34, Then the king will say to those on his right of Matthew 25, verse 34, Come, you who are blessed by my Father. Take your inheritance, the kingdom, prepared for you since the creation of the world. Four. And now he says, this is what you've been declared to be, and this is the evidence speaking that this is true, that this redemptive change in you has happened. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. 
I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. He's saying these basic needs that we have of human beings, of food, water, shelter, companionship, that true children of His see and they meet in the lives of others to the best of their abilities, to, to whoever they could reasonably call a neighbor, meaning uh, that person is close enough in proximity for followers of Christ to demonstrate the way of Christ and love of Christ to them. We love our enemies, which means that we work for a system of justice in our nation that is able to demonstrate, and stay with me here because a bunch of you are going to want to check out mentally, that's able to demonstrate the love of God and the truth of God to victims and to offenders. Now, let me say this, lest you think I'm saying something I'm not. It is not loving to give sentences to convicted offenders that are softer than they should be. Because when we do that, we deny to them the teaching power and discipline of legal punishment. And that's not loving. Part of what legal punishment is supposed to do is to curb the behavior in the future. And when we don't do that, when we let them quote unquote off easy, that's not loving. It's certainly not loving to the victims and their families. But it's not even loving to the offender. Because legal punishment is intended to discipline in a way that deters. There's actually a phrase for it. It's called the corrective discipline of the law. The corrective discipline of the law. If you take it out on a small scale, you think about disciplining your children. When you discipline your children in a punitive way, it is to deter future behavior at least a little. I mean, if you have many kids, you have that one kid that just doesn't seem deterred by much. I had an older brother like that. He got whippings back in the day, uh, just like normal people breathe air. And they never seemed to deter him from bad behavior or general human stupidity. Followers of Jesus have a divine mandate to love our neighbors. And we understand this to some degree. Part of the undergirding of our legal system is the guarantee of representation, even if you can't afford it. Now, this is no big deal until you're accused of a crime that you did not commit. And officers arrest you, and they book you, and you go to jail. And you know that you're buying all great value food, not name brand at Walmart. And you're wondering how you're going to be able to afford a defense attorney. Now, we all know that most public defenders are not the highest public, I mean, they're not the highest offense lawyers on the ladder. But it's brilliant, and it is a demonstration of biblical love to say to a person, and biblical justice, you will not face trial or face courts in the United States without a defense. You hope it's an adequate defense. Um, the best thing that we could imagine is that the prosecution and the defense would be attorneys of relatively equal skill and equal experience. That is often not the case. That is often not the case. In fact, many of them, both prosecutors and defense attorneys in the, in the public office, uh, are younger and less experienced. I heard a guy say this week, he said, yeah, because that's when you can afford to be a prosecutor. Um, those early years. Then once you can't afford it, you become a private defense attorney. So there's all kinds of problems with the system, but it still seems to be the best system that any earthly nation has come up with. And we know the issues with it. We know the issues with our system. We know the issues with race in our system. Um, I'm not a criminologist. I'm not a sociologist. I can't meet all that. I am a careful researcher. And so I, I look very closely 
uh, when things are thrown out, uh, that they have demonstrated correlation, not just the fact that two things happen simultaneously. Followers of Jesus have a divine mandate to love our enemies. Second biblical principle is that government has a divine mandate to protect the innocent and punish the guilty. Government has a divine mandate to protect the innocent and to punish the guilty. We saw that in 1 Peter 2, every human authority, whether the emperor as a supreme authority or to the governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. Punish those who do wrong and commend those who do right. And then, of course, we go back, and we have to go back to uh, Romans chapter 13 here. We can't talk about this biblical principle that we see demonstrated as early as Genesis 3 all the way through Scripture without going to the Everest of this teaching in Genesis or in uh, Romans chapter 13. Let me read verses 1 through 5. Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there's no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority, and you can just translate rebels against the laws instituted by the authorities, is rebelling against what God has instituted. And those who do will bring judgment on themselves. They bring the judgment on themselves in a just society where the government is doing the government's job. The government is the instrument, but they are the catalyst for it themselves. Bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right. In other words, as God has instituted government and human rule and authority, whether in a kingship, or democracy, or any other form of government, rulers should hold no terror for those who do right. But for those who do wrong. But what? But they do hold terror for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right, and you'll be commended. Now, to the degree that that's not true, you find an unjust system. To the degree that you or I based on anything, based on being a citizen of a particular nation, based on being in a certain socioeconomic class in a given nation, based on being a certain color or race, to the degree that this is not true and that we do indeed fear, we do indeed fear the rulers, even when we've done nothing wrong, it's a reflection of an unjust system of a system at work that is not reflective of what God has called it to be. You want to be from fear from the one of be free from fear of the one in authority then do what is right and you will be commended. For the one in authority is God's servant. Such a powerful phrase. I won't deal with it. We've already dealt with it. God's servant for what? What does the text say? God's servant for what? For your good. Let me put it another way. Government, as God has ordained it, is his servant for your good. And to the degree that government is not functioning for your good, for the good of the citizens of a given nation, that government is failing to live up to its divine mandate. They're God's servants. Agents of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Agents of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also as a matter of conviction. Verse 4 says that they bear the sword for no reason. Everyone reading Paul's letter in Rome would have known exactly what he meant, that they bear the sentence of execution, they do not bear it for no reason, right? The, the government has 
a divine mandate to protect the innocent and to punish the guilty. And part of what Paul's doing here, he's expounding a little bit on what he just said in Romans chapter 12. We usually miss this, but in Romans chapter 12, verse 19, Paul says, do not take revenge or vengeance, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. He says, you are not God's avenger, but God does have an avenger of justice, humanly speaking, and it is the hand of government, as government functions within the bounds that God has called it to function. Now, I have to say this, there is a, um, there's a, a Latin phrase, reductio ad hitlerum, reductio ad hitlerum, that people will often throw out here to say, well, what about Hitler? Hitler, I, I think, seems to be without question the most hated human being in all of human history, though he killed less than Stalin and some other tyrannical dictators did. But it's just a, a Latin phrase that translates to reduction to Hitler, and it's a, a logical fallacy that you'll hear. You hear it all the time right now in a uh, presidential campaign, and it, and it involves uh, invalidating an argument or statement of truth or trying to by comparing it to something that Adolf Hitler or the Nazi party would have said or would have done, right? But it is a logical fallacy because they'll say, well, what about Hitler? Well, you know from what we read that that the institution of government, including in Nazi Germany, is there by God's decree. Were they carrying out their divine mandate as God had given it to them? No. Should the church as a whole in Germany have risen up and spoken up about it from the very beginning? Yes. And they didn't. Most went right along with it, wrapping up the Bible in the Nazi flag. Thankfully, some, the confessing church, with Bonhoeffer and others leading it, did, but not near enough. Numbers 35, 31 through 34 reminds us of this mandate. Do not accept a ransom for the life of a murderer. I don't think this will be on the screens. Who deserves to die. They're to be put to death. They're to be put to death. Do not accept a ransom for anyone who has fled to a city of refuge. This is a person who has killed someone, but they've done it justifiably, but they're in fear of the family of that person meeting out retribution. So there are certain cities they could flee to in Israel, and they're safe. No revenge or vengeance could take place. So it says, do not accept a ransom for anyone who has fled to a city of refuge, and so allow them to go back and live in their own land before the death of the high priest. What would happen is the high priest in that city of refuge would listen to the case and decide whether or not the death was justifiable or straight accidental, whatever the case. It was not a murder. It was not one done with intent. And if that's the decision that's made, then, then the person who killed that individual, either accidentally or in self-defense or something like that, has the right to live and to prosper in this city of refuge, but cannot go back home until the high priest dies. When the high priest dies, that person's able to go back home. And so he's saying, the text is saying, you can't pay a ransom for the life of a murderer. You've got to put them to death. But also you can't pay a ransom for somebody who's not a murderer, but took the life of somebody else, because there is a degree of punishment there too. He's got to live in a different city for a while, and then he can return back. And that leads me to our third point this morning, third principle, that biblically punishment should generally be equivalent to the severity of the crime. And we all know when we see this going wrong. We know when we see a sentence that seems ridiculously harsh for the crime that was committed, and we know when we see one that doesn't touch the crime that was committed. And that instinct in you as the people of God is right. Hopefully it is spirit-driven by an understanding that in Scripture, punishment should generally be equivalent to the severity of the crime. I say generally because there are certain extenuating circumstances from time to time that have to be taken into account. But generally, it should be equivalent to the severity of the crime. We see that in the very beginning in Genesis chapter 9. 
after the flood, the Lord is speaking as Noah and his family has come off the ark and he's talking to them about matters of personal crime and particularly murder. And in Genesis 9, verses 5 through 7, the Lord says this, And for your lifeblood I will surely demand an accounting. I will demand an accounting from every animal. And from each human being, too, I will demand an accounting for the life of another human being. It's interesting that God says he will demand an accounting from an animal that kills a human being. But he says, for each human, too. Verse 6, whoever sheds human blood by humans shall their blood be shed. For in the image of God has God made mankind. What God is saying there is that murder is such, is such a severe crime. Not only has a life been taken, but a life that was intended by God, given by God to reflect his glory and his image has been taken. And so the only right punishment biblically for that is the life of the offender, is the life of the offender. You see that affirmed in Exodus 21, 14. You see it affirmed with the sword language in Romans 13. But then you also see teaching like in Exodus 22. I don't think this will be on your screen either, but you can. It, they, uh, all these verses are in the app, though, in the notes section of the app if you want it. But um, Exodus 22, verses 1 through 5, gives you a picture of, of this sort of leveling of punishment regarding the severity of crime. Exodus 22 says, whoever steals an ox or a sheep and slaughters it or sells it must pay back five head of cattle for the ox and four sheep for the sheep. The sheep weren't as valuable. If a thief is caught breaking in at night and is struck a fatal blow, the offender's not guilty of bloodshed. But if it happens after sunrise, the defender is guilty of bloodshed. In other words, if you can see the person coming in and you see they, po you see they pose no physical harm to you, before God, you have no justification for violence toward them. Anyone who steals must certainly make restitution. But if they have nothing, they must be sold to pay for their theft. If the stolen animal is found alive in their possession, whether ox or donkey or sheep, they must pay back double. If anyone grazes their livestock in a field or vineyard and lets them stray and they graze in someone else's field, the offender must make restitution from the best of their own field or vineyard. And so on and so forth it could go. You can read all of Exodus 22. Uh, the, the legal system in Scripture principally teaches this throughout the Bible, that punishment should be equivalent to the severity of crime. That's why throughout Scripture it is death for murder. It is the life of the offender for a murder because it's a life that's been taken. The punishment, uh, so to speak, has to fit the crime. And the only thing you can do to punish for someone taking another life is to take the life of the offender. Now, I am telling you what Scripture teaches, right? When you fast forward that and decide how do we live out this principle in the 21st century, in the United States, with the advances that we have, that's for you to decide. But there is no doubt that murder is at the top of human crimes, and it should be treated with intense severity, far more than it is often treated in our nation now. To do anything less is to cheapen the life that was originally taken. And again, it's just this important biblical principle of justice, that the punishment is saying something about the severity of the crime. And in the United States, our emphasis often is on punitive justice, on punishment, usually in the form of long prison sentences, which we have seen has created a whole, whole new list of issues for our country. Not everything and not everyone deserves a long prison sentence. Some do and some don't. In some cases, though, uh, prison sentences could, could rightly be replaced with reparations and um, productive community service. And there shouldn't be a weed in an incorporated community or a piece of trash on the street. There are a lot of folks who could be cleaning a lot of things up. It 
Yeah, enable offenders. Enable them to repay the one wrong and also contribute to society. But too far often in our system, it involves either a long prison sentence or a slap on the wrist. The Bible advocates for both. For punitive justice for some crimes and restorative justice for lesser crimes, for making restitution might be possible. So there's a place for both. You'll hear among, and it depends on whether you're like a, uh, for lack of a better term, a law and order conservative or a bleeding heart liberal, you'll hear these, these different things. Uh, you know, you'll hear a, a defense of almost entirely retributive justice, uh, punitive justice, punish, 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 and there's certainly a place for that. Or you'll hear that, that the entire penal system and justice system is built on the principle of restoration. No, it's not. No, it's not. To the best of our ability as a just society, and for us as followers of Christ, we want to see human beings restored. But sometimes a crime is so heinous, restoration is not on the table. Punitive sentencing is. That's it. Punishment is all that that crime calls for. To do less is to be unloving to the victims, to be unloving to the, to, uh, the perpetrator, who hopefully, even if it is a death sentence, has time to think very seriously about the condition of his or her soul before God, what they've done, the severity of it, and begin to change. Finally and quickly, the fourth principle is that the fallenness of man affects both crime and the justice system. The fallenness of man, the total depravity of human beings that every aspect of our life has been touched by our sin, has been affected by our sin, affects not only crime, it not only makes a 14-year-old walk in and kill four individuals and wound nine, six with gunshots in a high school. But that same fallenness affects the effectiveness of the justice system. To think it doesn't is naive to the degree that you border on stupid. Every prosecutor is a fallen individual. Every law enforcement officer is. Every defense attorney is. Every judge is. Every juror is. It affects both. It affects both. Um, a couple of thoughts on this. Leviticus 19.15 says, Do not pervert justice. Do not show partiality to the poor or favoritism to the great, but judge your neighbor fairly. Why is this imperative in here? Why does it have to be stated to not pervert justice? Because fallen man perverts justice for all kinds of different reasons, known and unknown at times. Proverbs 21, 15 says, When justice is done, it brings joy to the righteous, but terror to evildoers. That says something about the nature of true justice in society, that the righteous should be overjoyed by it, and evil doers in a society should feel terror when justice is done. Finally, Ecclesiastes 8.11, speaking of God's patience in judging the world, reveals a deeper principle about human behavior when it says, when the sentence for a crime is not quickly carried out, People's hearts are filled with schemes to do wrong. People's hearts are filled with schemes to do wrong. So the justice system can, it can mess up in all kinds of different ways and directions. It can over-sentence, it can under-sentence, it can try and convict too quickly, it can delay too long, prompting other criminals and crime. We've, we've learned so much since the, uh, the discovery of DNA in 1989 and since it really has come on the scene. We know, we know that we get it wrong sometimes. We, we know by terms of exonerations that at least 2% of death penalty convictions were wrong. And we assume by that, that, that up to, I mean, some people assume further, I think in my reading and research, you can safely assume as many as 4%. Now, that's not a high number unless you're in that 4%, or your son or your daughter is, or your husband or a brother. We know that we get it wrong sometimes. I was looking at a report from November 6, 2023, since 1989, and DNA, not all from DNA, but because DNA prompted so many um, opening cases, 3,284 people have been exonerated. 
Not, not let out on legal technicalities, exonerated because they didn't commit the crime. Those 3,284 people spent a combined 29,100 years in prison for crimes they did not commit. 2022, there were 234 exonerations. That's almost one for every business day. Last thing I'll say, and I know some of you are looking around going, thank God, it's about time. Um, you can't speak to this issue without, without at least commenting on the, the issue of race and justice in our nation. Uh, I've got good books, things you should read um, in the recommended reading section of your, um, of your sermon notes app. But David Baldus, the University of Iowa, did the most thorough study on this that's, uh, that I could find that's been done. It's fairly recent, of a thousand, a very controlled uh, research project. And what he found at the end of this studying race and conviction rates is that the race of the offender did not seem to be determinative on whether or not they received the death penalty. You're studying death penalty cases. But the race of the victim did. That in our society, we were far more likely to sentence someone to death when the victim is white than if the victim is a person of color. And this is not a uniquely American thing. Most nations have a predominant color. If I travel to most African countries, I'm not just a man, I'm a white man because I stand out as a minority in that culture. But this is our culture, and this is our thing to focus on. And as Christians, it should tell us that we've got some work to do loving and speaking so that all people, regardless of race, ethnicity, or color, have the same value in our nation. We know that more people of color per capita are incarcerated, and we also know the other truth, that more crime per capita happens in communities of color. Not due to race or color, but due to environment. So we've got a lot of work to do here. Those are the biblical principles. They speak for themselves. How we think about crime and about punishment and about the justice system should be informed by this. And if you read nothing else for us as a church, if you read nothing else, read Just Mercy. You can watch the movie if you have to. It's very good. But read Just Mercy. It's a powerful book. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you that your word leaves nothing unaddressed. That everything that we experience as human beings is either directly or indirectly addressed in your word. And God, in these times when so much is said about crime and about punishment, about the criminal justice system, about what is just and what is unjust, I pray that we as your people, God, would think biblically, would be thoughtful, would be theologically informed, would be discerning, God, and would speak and act out of wisdom. Lord, as we prepare to respond to you now with commitments indicated on our connection cards, God, with giving, if we give on Sunday morning as opposed to online or by text throughout the week, I pray that all commitments would be honoring to you. Father, I pray that your spirit would stir in our hearts and our minds. God, and I pray that we would live in glad submission to you. I pray in Jesus' name, amen.